Okay. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. Good evening. Because, as I said uh, yesterday, we are covering a lot of time zones, so to not exclude anyone. So, welcome to the third day of uh, Luxembourg uh, Oracle User Group. So, we will have one more day with presentations tomorrow. But for today, we have Sandesh, Robert, Alex Abala, and Mari Kupatadz. The name, uh, I hope I, I said correctly. Mari, forgive me <laughs> if I said incorrectly. Please let me know later. So um, let me just jump to the other screen. So uh, we are founded in 2019. Uh, we have more than 100 members right now. If you are not subscribed to our uh, membership on Portal, please do it. It's totally free. We have a lot of uh, articles published there, some videos, some webinars that we published uh, along 2019 and some webinars in 2020. So I will give the word right now to my great friend Sandesh Howe from Oracle. Sandesh is with you right now. All right, sweet. Thank you so much, guys, for this opportunity to present. Uh, give me a second. Let me just share my screen. I will stop to share mine. Sorry. All right. I need to. Thank you so much, man. Okay. Now you can do it. All right. I'm assuming you can see this. Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whichever part of the world you're joining from. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to present. Uh, my name is Sandesh. I've been at Oracle for 20 something years. I worked on all sorts of different spaces from databases, grid infrastructure, different kinds of languages. Uh, I've done development, I've supported customers, I've been on site. Uh, I worked on enterprise manager. So I've actually worked on a whole swath of products, but the last couple of years I've been concentrated on more on using uh, AI and machine learning for the uh, Oracle Autonomous Database in the back end for doing most of the AI ops based uh, management and operations. Uh, this presentation is going to focus on a different aspect. It's going to concentrate on auto ML and data science uh, using the Oracle Autonomous Database. So we have, we have uh, we've released uh, this thing called OML, the Oracle Machine Learning a uh, piece of infrastructure as part of the Oracle Autonomous Database. I'm pretty sure you've seen this in, in many in many presentations where you can actually write some uh, simple pieces of SQL code and uh, you, can, you can do all sorts of interesting machine learning on top of the existing data you have. Uh, this presentation kind of starts from there and takes it to the next level uh, as to how what is AutoML and what is actually coming in the subsequent versions of Oracle. So, uh, the agenda here is that we're going to talk a little bit about ML and the overview. We're going to talk about the journey of the DBA to a data scientist and what are the various things that you need to do to go from DBA to data scientist. Uh, we're going to have some examples of OML, and then we're going to talk a little bit about what AutoML is, what's coming, and uh, what is this thing going to do, and what aspects of machine learning is this thing going to automate. And then we'll have questions. Uh, feel free to type your questions in chat as we go. Uh, we'll also have some time to do this uh, at the end of the presentation, but if you type your questions in the chat as we go, I can answer all of them at the end of the presentation. So the first thing is, it's like today, traditionally, DBA is responsible for two major tasks. One, one of them is uh, all the maintenance tasks, which is configuration, tuning, uh, setting up of network storage, provisioning, database backup recovery, optimization. And then the second aspect of it is, you know, planning architecture, doing data modeling, you know, doing security, application lifecycle management, and stuff like this. So as we moved more and more towards the autonomous database, you know, more and more of the stuff that was at the bottom for maintenance tasks kind of started going away. And people needed to concentrate more and more on data modeling, architecture, data wrangling, and then writing all sorts of different reports using BI and AI uh, to be able to make the data more valuable to their business. So four different roles started emerging as part of this whole conversation. The first one was the data engineer. The data engineer is the person, and I think yesterday uh, my buddy Kamran explained it very well when he was talking about what data architects do and all of these other different roles uh, that have been created as part of uh, this transition. And it, the data engineer in this case is the guy that makes the data available to the data scientist, the person who does not do 
the actual machine learning themselves, but they're responsible for making vast amount of swathes of data organized in a manner that can actually be consumed by the data scientist. Then there's the data scientists themselves who basically look at this data and they, they try to solve these problems by making predictions. Then there's the data security role where data classification and lifecycle management come in. And then there's obviously the application tuning role, which is going to be there for a long time to come. The people go into SQL tuning, connection management, scale up, scale down, all of those kinds of activities. Uh, a little bit more into details when you're doing, uh, when, when you're a database developer and you're already doing most of this work because you're already doing data extraction, you're doing classic EDL, your data wrangling, you're doing these uh, deriving new attributes, right? Which is also called feature engineering as part of machine learning. So a lot of time is actually spent in cleaning up and organizing and bringing all this data, which is usually uh, not as efficient, but uh, it's something that we always do. Uh, the second part, which is in, you know trying to come up with predictions and insights and translating and deploying these models. Uh, this is actually the interesting part where a lot where the data management platform uh, comes into being. And that's where you want to concentrate most of your efforts as part of the machine learning uh, uh, features that we have. So organize data, wrangle them, try to get up, come up with the feature attributes, and then import all these predictions and translate and build your ML models. So this is a typical flow. Uh, over the years, what's been happening is uh, people have been taking all sorts of data and they've been converting it to uh, predictions and insights with machine learning. So something that started off with Apex reports and dashboards then it goes into diagnostic analysis and reports. You basically want to know what, why it happened and how, what are the details of what happened there. And then you want to know what is going to happen. So you go into predictive machine learning, right? You want to figure out uh, when should I buy something at a particular location? Is it a good time to buy a house? Uh, what should I invest in the stock market? You know, all these kind of things that are coming up. And then now it's like automated machine learning apps, right? I'm trying to sell something to somebody. Automatically, it scans my friends to see which ones of them are in that category. And it says, hey, you can sell this to your friend here because this person is working in a field that is uh, that is matching to a product that you want to sell. So the apps kind of take into the next level by using uh, whether it's predictive analytics, machine learning, social graph, and then try to enable the applications to make them completely ML enabled. So this is a transition that has happened where people have gone from complete dumb reports to complete ML enabled applications. Now, when you're doing machine learning, you should, you're sifting through huge amounts of data uh, machine learning and deep learning are two different categorizations, but we're just going to concentrate on machine learning for this purposes of this presentation. There are a couple of things you have to go through, the most common ones, uh, when you're trying to do something in machine learning. In this case, it is uh, whether you're trying to identify the most important factors, which is attribute importance, you're trying to predict customer behavior, that's a classification model, or you're trying to find out if you're selling insurance to somebody, who can you sell the insurance to where you make the maximum amount of gains, uh, that again is classification. Mm -hmm. Then there's regression where you're trying to uh, apply numerical quantities. When am I trying to buy the stock? When should I buy a house in this area? These are regression type of problems. And then you segment the population is in clustering. Like I'm trying to sell ice cream, which category of the population should I sell blue current to? These are all clustering kind of problems. And then you try to find fraudulent or rare events. Um, CPU utilization of this machine is about 90%. Is this a problem or not? Uh, network utilization is a couple of gigabits. Uh, is this normal or not? Is this going to flood my network or not? And then you la the last one is you try to determine what are the co-occurring items in a basket, which is basically you're trying to find associations. Uh, your shopping cart is a good example of this. You buy something, it says you might want to buy something else that is related to what people buy. So these are association-based problems. Some of these things fall into the category of supervised learning, and some of these fall into the category of unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning is where the machine learning algorithms themselves have the capability to scan data and find all these interesting patterns. And then they can say, oh, you know, this one I learned from, and these are the new kind of trends which you probably did not notice, but you want to probably build something on this. Supervised learning is the model is already trained or it is semi-supervised machine learning where a human is responsible for training the model. And then the model keeps learning more and more from whatever that has been specified as part of the model building process. One thing is, whenever you're doing any machine learning exercise, there's a couple of phases. There's understanding the business. You want to understand the use case. Then you understand your data. You basically want to do data uh, visualization, data analysis. Uh, you want to profile your data. You want to find out, uh, you know, whether it, how do you how do you how do you build your stats? Do you group them by a certain value? 
uh, whether they're univariate or bivariate statistics. So this is the data profiling aspect of it. Then you go into data preparation. For data preparation, you want to do, either you want to do automated transformations, you want to do binning, you want to figure out uh, if you want to normalize your information. Some of this is machine learning, some of this is not machine learning. So uh, most of this, most of us who have been doing ETL, about 80% of this stuff kind of falls within the ETL space. Uh, but the cool thing is this auto data preparation and binning and some of these other methods are things that the utility currently has where it can actually pull out some of these trends and tell you that these fields are important, these fields are not important. So it allows you to do automated feature selection. So that's also a part of the data preparation exercise. When you're modeling something, again, you do feature selections, you decide what model you want, you decide what the algorithms are, you decide what the hyperparameter settings for those algorithms are. So that's all modeling. Now, once you go into evaluation, you figure out which model is good. What are the particular values that you're selecting for the outcome of this model? Are you looking at F1 scores? Are you looking at mean square? Are you looking at root mean square? You're looking at whichever value that represents the most important things for you. Like some of the projects we've been building, they require good recall. Some of them require good precision. Some of them require good MSC scores. So we, depending on the use case that you're trying to look for, the model selection and the model comparison and evaluation methods change. Once you finish this, you have to deploy this. You embed this into an application. You write a report in Apex. You write a Zeppelin note stuff in something in a Zeppelin notebook. You deploy this using uh, in database ML or using REST as part of the database so you can expose this so that the user will have no ideas that you're actually using machine learning under the covers. So this is the part of the deployment cycle. But this is kind of like a standard methodology that most people will use when you're embarking on any machine learning project. We'll go into this in a little bit more details in a bit. So first thing I want to mention is Oracle's got this thing called Oracle Machine Learning. It was called Oracle Data Mining over the last couple of years when, you know, I have a friend uh, who's, who's a statistician and she basically came and told me once that you computer science guys are really good at this stuff because you always take these really boring terms like statistics, statistical algorithms, and suddenly call it machine learning and suddenly it becomes super hot. So she's been working on stats for like 10 to 20 years and she's like, it was never this hot. But now all of a sudden, everybody wants to run into you know, AI and machine learning because all of a sudden we've made this thing hot. So this was always an option that was available since Oracle 9i, and it was called Oracle Data Mining. Uh, of course, now the number of algorithms, number of interfaces, and the uh, number of applications that can run on top of these interfaces has significantly ballooned as compared to what this option existed in its infancy. So what this basically allows you to do is it's an in-database option. It allows you to build AI applications as well as analytical dashboards using either Apex or Notebooks or uh, Oracle Data Miner, which is basically an Oracle SQL developer extension, as well as you can build the uh, cognitive uh, image and text based services using this. The cool part about this is a couple of months ago, this thing was free. So if you're not used this, you don't have to pay anything for it. If you have an on-prem database, you can use this at no, uh, it's, it's, at no extra cost. And if you're using the autonomous database, all of this stuff also comes bundled up as part of the autonomous database offering. So you can actually call these as part of your Apex applications by just writing all these SQLs. So let's continue on this database developer to data scientist journey, right? So there's, there's six different steps here on how to go, to go into doing this. Uh, the first one is business understanding. You want to understand what your use case is. We went into this in a, in a high level. We'll go into this in much more details now. So the first one is understanding the business, right? So you want to understand what is a well-defined business statement. This is the most trivial aspect of the entire process. At least I see the way people treat it. But this is actually the most important. Because if this goes wrong, then more than 85% of the machine learning projects that I have worked on and I have seen that people have embarked on have failed in some form or the other because the business use case was not well defined. You really need to define what your use case is. And more than 70 to 80% of the use cases do not require any kind of machine learning. They can just be written as standard BI reports. So this is another one, another aspect of, uh, you know, uh, complicating an application and trying to make it way more complicated than what it actually needs to be. And people tend to do that. And most people are like, just because machine learning is cool, you need to use machine learning in every aspect. And that's not true, that's not good, because simple, simple query-based indexing and other methods like this are more than adequate to satisfy most queries. Uh, where you need to apply some kind of a predictive analytics and where you need to go into machine learning are very, very specific cases. 
So you have to be very careful, and this is actually the most important step where you need to understand what your business requirement is. And do you really need to use machine learning for most of this stuff or not? So I'm trying to predict employee turnover. So that's one use case. I'm trying to predict my customers that are churning. Like, do I have to give discounts to the customers to constantly keep coming back? Or who's the customer that constantly comes back, does not wait for discounts, pays full price, and still consistently comes back? Those are the customers I want. And then the customers that come back when I constantly give them a discount are some of the customers I long-term don't want. So I have to predict customer churn. If I stop giving uh, discounts, how many of these customers will stop coming? Uh, how many of customers have spent more than five hundred plus dollars in the in the eighteen in the most eighteen recent months? So there's this thing. It's called the RFM analysis or the recency frequency monetary analysis. There's a function that you can call as part of the uh, as part of the Oracle data mining uh, set of algorithms that allows you to calculate RFM analysis based on a period of time on some data, and it will automatically tell you which of these customers are the customers that are spent not just the spending more money but in terms of which ones are more likely to stick around and give you the most amount of gains. How can you sell more coffee? How can you sell more drinks? Which customers are likely to spend more? Who are my best customers? Which means rules and stuff like that. And how do I combat fraud? These are examples of use cases. The fraud is a very important example, right? So you basically roll up to uh, physicians, claimants, employees, and stuff like that. So how do you combat fraud? So here's one example that I'm taking for the purposes of this entire thing is to target customers who have good credit and you basically who are going to make payments. So when I when I want to basically uh, give something and I, I want to I want to pick customers, I want customers that are good credit. I know these customers will stick around. I know these customers are not going to default. So I not have involuntary churn. So here's a very good example of how do I target these customers? So what are my various steps for this? First of all, the most important thing to do is credit scores. So I go into credit scores and I'm just trying to query the credit scores and seeing what information do I have. Once I have this information, I have to actually see if this makes any sense. Uh, you know, is age positive? Uh, are the incomes values, are they weekly or monthly? And these values are, are, are kind of, they're not wrong. Uh, are the loan amounts reasonable? I mean, sometimes you have a loan amount that's uh, really high and I know this person is never going to be able to pay back these numbers. So these are data cleansing exercises or trying to ensure that everything is uh, on the same level. Uh, incomes are in the same unit. It's not weekly versus monthly. Age is correct. Somebody has not input in any wrong data. So you have to figure out all of these aspects. Then there's a lot of other stuff you can do where you can see, I want to see customers that have spent data by the maximum amount of credit cards. I want to bin them and group this based on uh, you know, how many number of open accounts they have. I want to find out based on loan amount as well as on income if I want to group and find out across these customers. So there's all sorts of different views I can create as part, as part of this uh, uh, notebook. So once I create these different exploratory graphs, I can understand which view of the data that I actually need. Now, sometimes this is more than enough for understanding the problem and trying to get saying, okay, I've got what I want and I just need to go. Sometimes this is just the initial exploration that is going to come to eventually to decide what attributes to use for the machine learning model. Again, there are different views. Now, the previous one was the notebook view. This one is the uh, data miner view, where you can see the same thing. You can see the binning, you can see the distribution, and you can see that there's a, there's a histogram here uh, that is automatically generated as part of the application that shows you a distribution or trend in line before you've even done anything with the data. So all this stuff is actually built into the application itself. All this comes to feature engineering or generating attributes. Uh, generating attributes, or in this case, is generating attributes that make sense for the kind of machine learning cases that you want to build. Like, I don't care about date of birth, I care about age. I don't care about the address, but I care about the commute time. I don't care about who, you know, how many calls they placed and stuff like that. I care about the number of dropped calls and what percentage of them were international. I want to know versus the peers, how much more money this person makes. Uh, I want to find out how much this person spends for food and clothing. So I don't care about the individual charges. I care about the charges binned by food and clothing. So there's, an, there's, an, there's a whole bunch of additional attributes 
And you know, we've we've known this as part of the Oracle database world, right? We build virtual columns which are derived from a combination of existing physical columns, and uh, we've you know we rely on the virtual columns to perform certain decisions. This is something like virtual columns, except these columns will not just be used for querying; they will be used as inputs or attributes as part of a machine learning model that we are going to build on top of this. So this is uh, feature engineering. In this in the uh, Oracle Data Miner UI. So I've, I've got different examples through the course of my presentation. Uh, some of them in the Data Miner UI, some of them are in the Zeppelin notebooks, but you can basically do the same functions in both. They're just different, they just look different. So whichever whichever way people are comfortable with. I like the notebooks, uh, but I know some people who really like the Data Miner UI and they try to play with this. So things you can, things you can do here, we, we spoke about this auto data preparation. The auto data preparation is basically try to find missing values, something that has requires aggregation, something that requires binning, some data is unstructured. All of this information can be automatically determined using built-in heuristics. So when you say determine inputs automatically using heuristics, it will go through and say that this one is, what type of mining type is this? Is this categorical? Uh, can it be automatically, it can be automatically tuned? Uh, is this something that, is used in most uh, models or this kind of concept, this kind of field is changed into some other kind of field and then used in the models. So like age can always automatically be binned uh, instead of using date of birth. So that the, the system does automatically for you because it knows that age is a, it's a much better value to play with as compared to date of birth. So this is the auto data preparation aspect of it, where you go through all the features and you decide which features you want to use. Now there's another there's another method for this is once you've visually inspected the features you've gone through the data what these features represent you go into something called attribute importance now when you're doing attribute importance that is a it's a method to uh, invoke when you pass a whole bunch of data and say based on the, this input data tell me which one is more important like if I'm trying to sell insurance should I look at a person's bank account or should I look at the number of claims they've made these are the examples of where I would use attribute importance as part of the mining function. And then it would automatically group it and give me the columns that are more important relative to each other. And then I pick those columns as part of the key attributes. Now you see, this is a lot of work just to come up with the interesting attributes of what I need to do. So, but this is very, very important because if I pick this thing wrongly, then my model is going to go completely haywire. So just a quick recap of the steps. I decide what I want to do. I want to find the customers that have the best amount of credit so I can sell stuff to them. I want to find out what are the attributes. I use auto data preparation to eliminate some of the columns. Then I use attribute importance to decide among the columns that I have now, which ones are the most important and which ones can be fed into a model. Now remember this, the biggest problem with feature engineering is if you feed too many inputs to a model in terms of attributes, then uh, the model takes way more time to train as compared to what it would be when you give a smaller number of features to the model. Just It's just like, you know, if I have a SQL query with, you know, 500 columns versus uh, 50, uh, 50 columns, it just makes it a lot more complicated to query and to figure out which columns are interesting, which columns are not interesting. So the more data you give to your model to train, the longer your training exercise is going to take, the more these attributes are going to influence the process of training, as a result of which, the output of this model could be complete garbage. So the goal of this entire exercise is to find the smallest number of features that will make the most amount of impact, and that's going to be used to train your model. That's all that this entire process so far that we have done is trying to do. It sounds complicated. Once you do this a couple of times, then you know this thing is really, really fast to accomplish once you once you do this uh, iteratively a couple of times. So once you know you've picked the attributes, right? The next step is basically training these models. Now, most of the most of the default models we have use 60, 40 random samples. There's this thing, it's called cross-fold validation. A cross-fold validation is a process where you take, uh, you take say an example, I'll take, a, I'll take some, some data, divided this into 10 pieces, right? And then what I do is I take one piece, I pull it out, and I swap that between the training and the testing sets, and I run it against the remaining nine. And then I keep doing this in a rolling window fashion. So I take the next set, I take the next set, I take the next set. So I keep switching testing and training 
with this. Now, this is a process in this case, because it's 10 pieces I've divided this training set into. It's called 10-fold cross-validation model. So by doing this, what you're doing is you're, you're moving a portion of the training model and using that iteratively as testing by removing it as part of the, the model. And you're trying to improve the chances of trying to find a good test train model split. Again, this process is called n-fold cross-validation. And in this case, by default, we're using 60, 40 random sample splits for doing this. So once you split, you can also apply n-fold cross-validation on top of this entire process. Once you build these models, there are four aspects that change. One, the testing and training data, the combinations of them. So as you can say, there's more testing, there's less training, there's more training, there's more training, there's less testing, and then you take a chunk of the training model, you put in a testing, you take a chunk of the testing, you put it back in the training, you keep swapping data back and forth. So the test and train model splits is one of the variables to change. The second one is the attributes. You can decide which attributes to pick, you can decide the attributes based on attribute importance, based on different kinds of feature engineering. The third aspect is uh, you can change your algorithms. You can decide you want to use decision, tree, decision trees, you want to make use of any of the deep learning models with LSTM. So you can switch on the model, you can switch on the algorithms. The fourth aspect is you can change the hyperparameters. One you change the hyperparameters. So hyperparameters to an algorithm in a model are in a daughter of parameters to a database. That's the relationship. So when you change the hyperparameters, it changes the way the model actually performs its task. Uh, like if you're doing, uh, you know, if you're doing, uh, most of the algorithms have an n random value for performing its operations. Uh, if you're using a uh, random forest, then you can, you can you know, change the number of forests as you go, the K values. So this clustering, you can change, for K means you can change the K values. So there's all these different hyperparameter attributes that you can change as part of the machine learning model. Uh, so these are the four things, the test train data, the hyperparameter optimization, the algorithms themselves, and the attributes. And you have to basically do a permutation of all of these continuously to come up with which of these models gives you the best score. Now, earlier, this used to be a manual process. Earlier when I'm talking about meaning about a couple of years ago, slowly there have been more and more auto ML systems that have been basically taking on this task. And auto ML is a different topic. We will cover this as we go for further in the presentation. But this entire process is automated today and can be run as part of a framework where you can basically run and say, give me the model with the best score for this. And it will automatically do all of this stuff for you. Once you do this, you, you randomly hold out samples. You mentioned, I, I told you, right, we're doing a random sampling where we, where we hold out a certain percentage of the training data and we use it as part of testing, the cross-fold validation process. Uh, once you do that, you calculate the outcomes, which are the gains, the lift, the accuracy, and once you use these things, you can decide which particular attributes to change, which model makes sense. So the model evaluation exercise is to compare the outcomes of all of these different algorithms and try to see which ones of these make sense. If I'm looking at lift, I'm looking at accuracy, I'm looking at gains, I'm computing cumulative F1 scores. I have to decide based on what metric I'm going to use to come up with these algorithms. And then you deploy this. So when you deploy this, this, the SQL statement is just going to call, in this case, I'm using prediction probability with the N1 class model, which is basically a classification model, to automatically determine what the credit score bin is going to be. Now, this might require some training. Uh, there's also, when you build the model, like in this case, I'm building a, a model called claims model. I'm, I'm using something called support vector machines, which is one of the model types. I'm using auto preparation for this exercise. And, Automatically, when you apply the model, and then you can just run the queries, it'll tell you which are the policies and which are the percentage of fraud that's most likely to be happen in most of these policies based on the previous claims that these people have done. So you see, it's, it's, it's not that complicated. It sounds complicated, but it's not that complicated once you do this iteratively a couple of times. Very simple SQL functions. And all of these algorithms are basically built inside the database. So if you have you're already doing uh, ETL exercises. You already have, you know, facts and dimensions and you're running queries and joins against these things. This is just one extra layer where you basically have to, uh, you know, decide which algorithm to use, what amount of which attributes to pick, and then you run this training. And then once you fit the model, you can run the queries and just get their outcomes all inside the Oracle database without actually having to move away from this. 
So these are these are typical steps for a data scientist. Now let's move to more examples, right? So here's a here's an example for uh, I'm trying to find the average purchase, purchase amounts for men versus women and their group by income level. So I'm using this thing called t-test. Now, so when you do stats t-test in the view, these are the functions you can use. You can basically find p-values, the two-sided p-values as they're called. Now, this p-value is less than 0 0.05 shows statistically significant differences in the amount purchased by men versus women for those particular category types. Now, here's an example of a simple statistics-based SQL query that will basically give you this answer. This is example number one. Another one, I want to attribute importance. Remember, we spoke about attribute importance a lot when it comes to feature engineering. In this case, I specify the attribute importance. I specify the tables and the columns, and then which is the target column type I want to influence. And then I also specify the settings for the attribute importance, which are also. So the way this works in this is that you have to create a separate table for the settings, and you have to insert the values, the hyperparameters for those settings inside this table. In this case, it's ADT import mode settings. And then you can query the attribute name rank value. And when you do all of this, it tells me that the most important thing is to find out if the person has enough money in the bank and if they have overdrawn any money monthly. So these are the two things that uh, you want to look at before trying to you know, go for that person for your insurance. So th this, is, this is attribute importance. Same thing for if you want to build this in R. So OML has different implementations. The current implementation in production is OML SQL, which is basically you can write all your machine learning code in SQL. Now we're coming up, now there's, there's OML for R and there's OML for Python. It's called OML for Pi. These are two, these are two of the distributions that are coming. Uh, OML, uh, OML for Python is, is my favorite because you know, a lot of machine learning languages are, or machine learning platforms like scikit-learn, which is where I learned most of my stuff from, are basically written in Python. So Python is a very, very flexible language. Some people love SQL. They can stick to OML for SQL. But if you're a Python guy, people are like, eh, I have fewer choices. How do, I, uh, how do I operate against the Oracle database without pulling data out of the Oracle database? Right? So one thing, one thing you see is a lot of people, what they do is they extract data out of a database. They make it into a CSV file. They load this into a Pandas data frame. And they run their queries against it. Once they've built a model, they push it back to disk. And then they import the results back into a database and they run the query reports on the database. So there's all this back and forth. Now, when the data is just running into a couple of gigabytes, it's okay. But when you're running into several terabytes of data, this is the same problem you used to have when you're working with Hadoop installations, where people take huge amounts of data from Hadoop, they move something from Oracle, and they move it back to Hadoop. The data, du data duplication, as well as data movement, and you're creating huge amounts of work when you're moving data across two platforms. So one thing we kind of came to a conclusion of is we need to support Python natively as part of the uh, database stack. We need to support R natively as part of the database stack so that people no longer move data back and forth between this because it's not efficient. It takes a lot of time. So the goal is to move the algorithms to the data and not the other way around, not to move the data to the algorithms and try to do something and then move the data back into where it originally was. Uh, Here's an example of doing this for the OML for Pi. This is coming. Uh, this will be supported within the autonomous database platform. It will also be available as a standalone download that you can actually run on your machine against a 19C or 20C database with the, uh, the data mining option built into it. And all they're doing is you're creating the AI model and you're fitting the AI model using the train X and train Y, which is basically the, uh, the training and the, the training model in this case. Uh, the X, and, the X and Y again represent the labels. The Y represents the labels, the X represents the input attributes. Uh, again, it shows you the uh, importance and the same, the same exact exercise with the uh, Python. Now, the autonomous database has obviously had this for some time. We had we have this OML package. A lot of people have seen the notebooks. Uh, I'm not going to go through this too much because I've, we've, there have been de enough presentations on this. I know, I know my colleague Heli has spoken about this, uh, you know, and Edelweiss has spoken about this. They've spoken uh, enough uh, about the various features of what, what are available for all of this. Uh, I'll concentrate on uh, the things that are coming. And this is interesting because this, this significantly changes the game for us. So first of all, 
a lot of people, like I'd mentioned, move data back and forth from the database and they, they try to take the data to their servers, they make CSVs, they play with stuff and they move it back. So the first thing we decided to do was build a transparency layer. Now, what is a transparency layer? Imagine a data frame that basically connects itself to the backend as a table and you can manipulate and do all sorts of stuff to it without even realizing you're actually connecting to a table and without writing a single line of SQL. So anything you do in Python or R, you can manipulate a data frame object. You can take the out output of this data frame object and make a scikit-learn library operate on it. So think of it as a join between some stuff I'm doing in scikit-learn, some stuff I'm, I'm doing using OML, and I'm combining their results together to basically get my output. So you can combine things between two different languages, two different sets of libraries, and use proxy objects so the data continues to stay in the database. So it looks and behaves like a Pandas data frame, but it is basically uh, something like a DB link, you know, to make it simplistic. It's like a DB link into a database at the back end. And someone who does not know SQL can completely write all these things in Python. Uh, there's, it, it basically overrides all the native functions to and translates the underlying functionality to SQL. So if, you, if you're a guy who doesn't like SQL and is a person who's function, familiar to working with R and Python, and there are many of us who are like that, this is great to manipulate database data without actually having to get into the database at all. Uh, there's the thing that the thing that we spent the last couple of years working on is basically trying to make some of these algorithms more parallel, more distributed. Now, there's a there's a lot of the stuff lying in open source, and some of these open source algorithms might be way more cutting edge and ahead of the stuff that might be inside the database. But the thing in the data, that we have in the database. It's basically tried and tested, stabilized. We know this stuff really works. And we're adding every, every subsequent version that comes out. The algorithms that we know that absolutely work, uh, we expose these as part of using OML for SQL. So like we added uh, stuff for time series. I'll talk about a few new algorithms we've added as part of 19 and 20C. But what we do is the algorithms that we know for sure they work, they're not experimental, someone's not trying to write a paper on them. These work and they're production deployable and they're reliable enough for you to build your models on. And we know that these models really work and its outcome really works. We add those algorithms to the database itself. So some of these algorithms, they can be run in parallel. Now, everybody knows about ext proc. ext proc allows you to run all sorts of things. So most of the stuff for OML for Pi and OML for R are basically not using ext proc as external processes that connect the database and do something and return results back to us. So there's a client that connects to the database, runs queries against it, and then the database server itself can spawn off more helpers to do something outside and then punch the results back into the DB all while keeping the data consistently inside the DB. And that's the, that's the parallel distributed algorithm aspect of it. And then we are obviously focusing towards auto ML because we don't want people to do feature selection, model selection, hyperparameter tuning. Uh, there's a whole bunch of existing clients that are already there. For people who want to use R, there's R Studio. If you want to use notebooks, there's Oracle Machine Learning. Uh, people who love SQL Developer, have it has an Oracle Data Miner option. So there's stuff for everybody, and it's, it's applicable across a swathe of languages. Uh, AutoML is most interesting. I already spoken about most of the content on this slide. The thing that's most interesting is, is auto, auto, it automatically reduces the number of features by identifying things that are most predictive to improve the accuracy of the algorithms. So basically, it does not require you to be an expert. It's going to automatically figure out which things are interesting for you. Now, the, the, the good thing that's coming is there's going to be a new OML, AutoML interface. And what this is going to do is it's going to automatically bin data. It's going to show you importance as part of this data. It's going to have a model leaderboard. It's going to show you which models are good, which models are known to perform better as compared to the other models. And you can deploy all these models using REST. You can track a model if the performance of the model is degrading as part of this. Like It's like you, know, you push out a new, uh, f uh, a new model for a Facebook feed, and suddenly you realize that the engagement drops. You can immediately go back and revert back to the previous model for your Facebook feed. The same thing here is like you release a report and people are using this report for doing something and suddenly people stop using the report because the report doesn't work. So you need constant model monitoring where someone will continuously iterate through this model and try to find something better than what's already out there. Or if the model regresses once it's actually released into production, like it works for day one and then suddenly people realize that this model really does not work. 
and then people stop using it. So that's model monitoring. So this will allow data scientists to take this to the next level where they don't have to run all these things. Uh, it will automatically calculate the histograms. It will automatically calculate the importance. It will run the various combinations of algorithms and calculate a score. And then you get all of the various values that are necessary for you to make a decision as to which ones you want to use, as well as it will have a model leaderboard and then it will do monitoring. So this is coming. It will allow you to do a whole swathe of functions. Like here's an example with SVM Gaussian 1, what sort of deployment it is, and uh, you know what do you want to basically predict. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a whole bunch of new features that are coming as part of this. The two new algorithms I mentioned earlier that we added in this case for 20C. Now, XGBoost is, is present in almost everything. And uh, you know, it's like it's it's one of the Gaussian methods that is very, very popular, and that's used for classification, regression, ranking, and survival. So one of the things we wanted people to do is we wanted them to be comfortable with the same algorithms that are basically available across all of the open source data, uh, the open source packages out there. We wanted these things to be present inside the database. So these two basically gave us the biggest bang for the buck. So there are a couple of other things for time series also that we're working, but these two other ones that are worth mentioning at the moment, which is gradient boosted trees or XG boost. And then the other one is basically MSET, SPRT, which is multivariate state estimation techniques and sequential probability test ratios. Now these are, the second one is an anomaly detection uh, algorithm to monitor processes. And what we do is we use this as part of some of our AI ops exercises to look for some kind of an anomaly from the signals that we are trying to basically monitor. This, uh, there's Oracle, Lab, we, have a, we have a group called Oracle Labs where people build some of these algorithms, they speed them up inside the database, they try to re-implement them in different ways so it can easily be consumed as part of the database itself. So this MSET SPRT method is one method for anomaly detection that we use pretty heavily internally within the company and something that you can use as well. And XGBoost, everybody knows what gradient boosted trees are. It's an extremely popular method for performing classification regression. There are tons of Kaggle competitions as part of this stuff. Uh, I mentioned there's the Oracle Data Miner UI. I'm not going to spend too much time. Uh, there's all these uh, various uh, templates that are available as part of the uh, autonomous database. So the bottom line is you can basically manage and analyze your data. If you have the big data appliance, you can do all sorts of stuff with it with Hadoop with Hive, with Kafka. So the conclusion sort of is, you don't need to move your data. I think that's kind of the number one conclusion you can take is moving your data around is inefficient. If you can run most of the machine learning in the database, it basically saves you huge amounts of time to try and do this. You can set up data preparation and transformation using automatic data prep going forward. Uh, this thing will save copious amounts of time in terms of preparing the, you know, remember all this is after you already have the data, you've already cleansed it, you've already loaded them, they've already done the, the you know, you've built up your partitioning data scheme, you've built facts and dimensions, you know how you're going to query all this stuff. After this, you want to build the models on top of this. You want to use automatic data prep to decide which, which of the attributes you're going to build. Uh, it doesn't matter what language you know, you know, SQL, you know, R, you know, Python, you can, uh, whether you like writing stuff in notebooks, you like writing stuff in the UI, in data miner, it doesn't matter which method you like to do. There are so many different ways to get to this. And the most important thing is you do not require the machine learning skills because AutoML significantly speeds up the entire model building exercise. So as long as you're concentrated on your business goal of getting good results, you really don't need to know how these algorithms are implemented, where they're implemented, how, uh, you know, how good these algorithms are relative to each other because these things keep changing. So here's an interesting stat, right? So my, my team works on all of these different kinds of uh, exercises for AI ops. Sometimes we spend three to four months working on something and then we figure out a new algorithm or model that basically obsoletes all that three to four months worth of work. It's very, very common for us to basically hit these kind of scenarios. So one thing we realized is we don't want to concentrate on the model building exercise. We don't want to concentrate on the hyperparameter optimization exercise. That's what AutoML is for. We only want to concentrate on the outcome of this model and does it satisfy what we want to do. So it significantly lowers the barrier to entry for the average person who has no ideas of what machine learning is, but understands 
their data really well and knows what the outcome they want from this data. And then there's obviously, uh, you know, you don't need uh, you don't need a second instance for production to transform any data. All the data is embedded. All the transformation is embedded. And once you have, uh, you want to do model scoring, we've accelerated model scoring as part of Exadata. And this thing can be done repeatedly as many times as you want. You see this chart. Uh, now people ask like, why, why do you guys talk about all of this? So for people that are data scientists, I kind of like do this on a daily basis. They want to know if their favorite algorithms are supported. They want to know what are the various kinds of functions that are available. They want to know what language packages do they have, whether we do things with like time series, right? Like we use whole winters pretty heavily using time series. So I want to know if whole winter support is present or not. I like lasso for regression for based on the things that I do. For attribute importance, I like PCA. So if you want to know if the methods that you are commonly using as a data scientist are available or not. So this goes from the standard three bins of machine learning for classification, clustering, and regression to going to anomaly detection, to going to time series, going to attribute importance, and then going to text mining. If you want to build something using explicit semantic analysis for document similarity. So we use a combination of ESA and DFIDF internally for scanning all the logs that we get from uh, from the database, from Exadata, and all of that sort of stuff. So this thing gives you a perspective of the vast swath of algorithms that this thing supports, and that you know if you go for this, it's going to have not just the algorithms for machine learning, but also a whole bunch of statistical functions. You know, the ones we most commonly use are median standard deviation, you know, min, max, lag lead functions for SQL. These are very common because most of us know these. Ranking functions and cross tabulations are also pretty common. But you know, ANOVA, uh, linear regression, uh, t-test, f-test. These are not very commonly used by DBAs, and some people don't know what this is. Uh, but we have support for these. So it's it, it, like one of the examples I had provided earlier was you know the ones where you're trying to determine uh, you know for men versus women you know based on the income levels who spends more for what items, and that was an example for t-test. So there are, there are lots of more examples. As you see those examples, you realize when you can actually apply some of these statistical functions. And they're just a simple function call as part of SQL. So there's no learning curve for you as a deviator or developer. If you want to make use of some of these functions, you see a couple of examples. It's like learning from Stack Overflow. And once you figure this out, you know that the database has the support for all of this. To conclude, ML and AI are just algorithms. You don't need to learn any of this stuff. Uh, you can use what's already there, uh, but you have to move the algorithms to where the data is. And that will significantly save you a huge amount of time when it comes to doing all of that stuff. Thank you. And uh, that's what I had. Questions? I want to stop sharing and probably go to chat if I have any questions now. Thank you, Sandesh. Um, I think the guys didn't. I think I bamboozled the audience. Any questions? Yes. There is any questions on YouTube? No, there is no uh, questions. So, by the way, I, I just want to mention this: that you know, this is a lot of content to take in. If you got even ten percent of this, consider it good, because you know, most of us spend months trying to learn some of this stuff. The cool thing about this entire field is it's sort of like democratizing. You don't really need to know the details of how this stuff works uh, in order to uh, try to figure things out. Okay, um, we have one question now. Does OML support unstructured data? Yes, yes. So all those algorithms, half of them operate on top of unstructured data. Thank you. Any other questions, guys? I think so, people are too shy. Are you qualified all questions? <laughs> I think I think the best way to get your hands dirty on this. So, like I said, if you have like a database 19C available, you can install a uh, data miner, or you can uh, you know get a notebook fired up and work against this. Or if you're just too lazy to do any of this stuff, you know just create a free autonomous database account 
create a machine learning user and uh, you can uh, just log into that and start using all the existing notebooks that are already there. There's tons of sample notebooks for you to get started. It should not take you more than 15 minutes to start writing your own pieces of machine learning code. So lots of examples, lots of templates uh, that are already there. All you need to know is SQL. At the moment, OML for SQL is the only thing that's there inside the autonomous database. But OML for Pi and OML for R will be shortly available for doing this. I think have... OML for Pi is a game changer. Sorry, go ahead, please. No, no, it's okay. Sorry. Uh, we have one more uh, from Andre. Uh, what do you think uh, for the next movement uh, of autonomous database? What we can expect from autonomous features? I think regarding... I think this is it's a platform. Mm -hmm. uh, there's more and more there's more and more applications that are going to come around this platform. So I remember this when we started off. It, I mean, the autonomous database was intended to automate a whole bunch of stuff. But uh, the key that I always felt was the support of applications that are going to be around it, right? So how do you load your data? How do you query your data? How do you have uh, support for Apex for building reports on top of your data? How do you, uh, th th you, need, you need a whole bunch of other things that will allow you to utilize the platform. So it's the, the power is in the applications, not in the platform. The platform is just a platform. It's like electricity, right? You turn on a switch and you don't care about the power plant and, and you know, your transmission wires and all of this other stuff that comes to it. But it's the, you know, it's the device that connects to the electricity that it's like, right now it's like super hot. Where's the air conditioning, right? But I don't think about the electricity that's powering the air conditioning. So machine learning, APEX, uh, uh, the, the ability to basically do OML for Pi, where Python developers can gain access to this. It's, it's a vibrant apps ecosystem. And I think we started developing that uh, over the last year or two, and I think that's going to significantly accelerate. So more and more developers can basically use the platform. If they don't care about the platform, it doesn't matter. They can just use the platform and then the application ecosystem around the platform will continue to develop. So uh, from SQL, de SQL uh, developer to SQL developer modeler to uh, Apex to uh, OML to OML for uh, Pi to OML for R, uh, AutoML, all of these are just going to accelerate the applications ecosystem around the autonomous database. And I think that's that's the thing that gives me the kick for it. You know, it's like people come and tell me, oh, I added this feature for autonomous. Now we do this thing a little faster and stuff like that. That doesn't excite me as much as much as like when I see, oh, you've added XGBoost support. Finally, it's like, what took you guys so long? You know, because I've been using XGBoost as part of scikit-learn, TensorFlow, and all of these open source packages for some time, and I need the same features inside the database to make it at par and say, hey, look, why can't I use my favorite algorithms in the database for doing most of this stuff? So that is changing. So today, if I have to write something, say, for example, I was using scikit-learn for something, I will move a couple of terabytes of data, and then I move, I move this somewhere, I do something with it, and I move the data back. I still always keep doing this back and forth, and this, after a while, just gets really annoying. And now I just write a simple bunch of SQL statements. I don't have to move data anywhere. And it basically does the exact same thing. So it's after a while when you start using it, it's incredibly powerful. Uh, notebooks think, and notebook servers are very popular. Uh, we have two more questions. Uh, are we? One, can I access the ML2 from the always free uh, account? Yes, yes. And uh, okay, yeah, just a continuation in the same module. And uh, another one is how uh, uh, can a DBA migrate to this area to play with machine learning? What is the easy path or what so kind of uh, recommendation you can give? So there's, there's a, like I said, the, the first thing you do is just go into OML. Uh, I don't know if I have it here, give me one second. Just share your uh, screen again because I think you're stuck. Yeah, give me a, give me something's happened. This thing has just crashed. Hang on, I'm just gonna I'm gonna post a link in chat. Mm -hmm. Just give me one second. Yeah, I'm just gonna post this thing in chat. Okay. Here we go. So this, this basically shows you how to get started with OML notebooks. Nice. If you're a DBA, you don't know what to do, start here. So mm -hmm. you, you, need to, you need to have a free autonomous database account. When you create an autonomous database, you go into service console, and in service console, you create an OML user. 
Once you log in as that OML user, you can do everything that I've suggested. You can fire up notebooks, you can write. So right now it's OML for SQL. You can only write code in SQL. Uh, at some point in the future, in the near future, you'll be able to write things in Python and R directly into the notebooks. So all of this will operate on top of data that already sits inside a database. And a data frame will basically be a representation of the table that is there underlying. And it will look very familiar to you. So you can actually use it with scikit-learn libraries or any of the other libraries that you want. So, nice. and yes, this is all part of the autonomous database free OML package. Perfect. So, so also I remember I mentioned to you, if you download like 19C, all this is part of the DB, it's part of the data mining package and it's all free. So all of this machine learning stuff that I spoke about is free whether you're using it in an autonomous database or whether you're using it on-prem. Of course, you have to set up your own notebook servers. You have to have uh, you have to deploy these functions using REST, and you have to expose them to your notebook servers. If you're doing them manually, if you're using the autonomous database, someone has already set up a bunch of network notebook servers for you, and you, there's less work for you to do. Uh, but if you use this on-prem, you write these functions, you can expose them via REST, and uh, you can you can uh, build a notebook server and just connect. You can use uh, the stuff from Jupyter. And you can connect it directly to these uh, REST calls coming from the database. Very nice, Sanesh. Any Sweet. more questions? <laughs> no, I like I said, even if you learn 10% from what I've said, it's great. That's the idea. Get slowly started, you know, start playing with things. The, the only way you're gonna learn is the more and more, the more, the more you play with this stuff, the more you learn with it. Otherwise, it's just just, just get this thing out of your head, okay? Machine learning is not complicated. Just like how, you know, I remember when I used to teach stuff for Rack, people were like, ooh, Rack, multiple instances, all this stuff. This is, you know, this is all complicated. It's not complicated. You don't need to know the algorithms. You don't need to know statistics. You don't need to be a math major. You don't need to know any of this stuff. Don't listen to what people tell you, okay? You, as long as you know what your problem is, what you're trying to solve, all of these are just tools. This is no different than the tools that come up with, say, 20C new features for database, and there's a whole bunch of new features for you to learn as a DBA or a developer. Uh, machine learning is just one more tool in that Swiss Army knife of tools that you have. And you can use this without actually knowing any of these algorithms or how they work or you know how they built and stuff like that. And that's from me. Uh, when you realize that you uh, want to uh, play with uh, machine learning in what moment in your career you start to looking at it you know lots of people uh, learn this because they think they want to be cool want to show the fact that they're learning machine learning and you know you kind of know something that some other people don't know uh, i have been in the debugging space for pretty much the last 15 years of my career i spent time working uh, troubleshooting accelerated environments and then i realized that there's a lot of stuff that we do on a daily basis that basically can be automated. We start writing scripts, you know, like what we used to do like 10 years ago, continuously writing stuff. Today we have automated using Ansible, Chef, Puppet, and all of these other frameworks, uh, run books, uh, run as, and all of these other things that are currently available. And then I realized automation is just one aspect of it, but there's a lot of problems that can be solved by simple machine learning, where I'm looking for workloads, I'm trying to determine an adaptive baseline, all of these things can be a, a simple machine learning examples for how to do this. So I got, I got into machine learning to solve my own problems, to solve my own pet peeves, because I didn't want to keep doing the same thing. You know, laziness invents most stuff. I'm an extremely lazy guy. So if I do something like five times, I have to spend more time to try to figure out how to automate it, because I don't want to do it again. It's boring. So the more I started working on this stuff, the more I realized that we're spending too much time doing this. We're spending too much time doing this. We've done this 50 times in the last one week. Why the hell can't we automate this? And it's that pet peeve for me that I started working on using machine learning. So for me, it was not what the, everybody else does. Oh, you know, I want to learn machine learning because I want to look cool. I want to, you know, survive in my career. I want to it happened naturally. It just happened naturally because I had a problem that I wanted to solve. I'm not a mathematics major. I'm not a statistical person. I, I'm not a, I would not grade myself as an ML expert either, but I'm a learner. So I look at problems, I look at tools, I see which tools apply to my problems. I learn those things and I move on with that. So that's, that's why I keep encouraging people, 
do not think you have to be an expert in something to be really, really good at it. You just start playing with things and you slowly, you know, you just grow into it. You know, if you enjoy it, you just grow into it. So machine learning is one such aspect of it. We also receive a hello from Gianni Cereza. Uh, it's following on YouTube and also Rodrigo Sweet. Jorge. Awesome. Thank you, man. <laughs> Thanks a lot, guys. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Enjoy the rest of the day, guys. A lot of interesting sessions coming after this. Yeah. Now we will have the session of uh, Robert Mars. Thank you for the attendees to come uh, to join uh, us today. And thank you for watching. <laughs>